Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Addictions, Abuses, and Recovery. My name is Sherry Irvin and I will be your host today. With me, I have special featured guest star, Tammy Tenderos. Tammy and I are going to sit down and we're going to discuss addiction and recovery from a different perspective, from the perspective of being a spouse. Tammy's going to share her experience, strength, and hope, and she's going to share with us some of the flaws that she sees with the system and how they can be changed. So, on that note, let's talk some recovery. It is my pleasure to introduce to you my really good friend, Tammy. Hi, Hi. Tammy. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. We all know that uh, recovery is beautiful, but addiction also is very messy. Mm -hmm. And along with that, what people don't realize is often the family is the collateral damage. We are, you guys are the blowback from that. I know myself with active years of addiction that I didn't care what I did. I would borrow, beg, steal. I would do anything I could to get that drink on. And we are manipulative people. So we're not seeing the collateral damage that we're leaving in its wake. And that is the family. The family suffers the most. Yes. So if you could share with us, um, the audience, what the beginning was for you and what you've gone through. Um, well, Dave and I, we've been together 30 years, married almost 28. Um, I think um, drinking for us was always um, a thing. Um, from the beginning, even Dave, even before we met, high school, um, I was always drinking. Um, I think it got really bad after maybe my mom died in 04, that Dave's drinking went to a whole other level of um, making, you know, a few beers here and there with friends wasn't enough anymore. Um, going through um, infertility, having troubles when we did get pregnant, that took its toll. Um, then when we adopted our son, um, by that time the drinking was he was drinking pretty close to every day, um, drinking to a point that maybe to numb the feelings, maybe, um, numb the issues that were going on. Um, that I guess that's his story. Um, but having Jordan, um, really opened up my eyes because I didn't want Jordan to be raised around that. Um, you know, he would drink and drive with Jordan in the car. That was an absolute no-no to me. Um, then at our campground, it'd be easy. You'd start off in the morning with Bloody Marys. By noon, you start on the beer. By mid-afternoon, you switch to the hard stuff. Um, Dave's drink of choice back in the day was Captain. Um, then he would switch to vodka because that was easier to hide. Um, you didn't get that smell. Um, uh, then Dave got hurt at work. You fast forward to December of 2011 and I was at my breaking point that the drinking was just out of control. Um, I don't really remember a whole lot of sober times for Dave in 2011. Um, he got injured at work. He had to tell me that he, they drew a blood test and he had to let me know that after I went to bed the night before, after we'd had a conversation that I'm kind of done. If you don't, you know, you, you can't tell an alcoholic you need to quit. Um, and so I had just said, Dave, just back off, just taper down, just, you know, and that night I thought everything was fine. He'd had a couple beers. We went to bed. He admitted that he waited till I fell asleep and then got into the vodka. So he did. He went to work the next morning. He said, yeah, I was still drunk. Um, and so when they drew the blood test, yeah, he wasn't over the legal limit, but he still had alcohol in his system. Was it a lot? No, but it was there. And so he got suspended for two weeks. And that was when I just kind of went, everything that we built over all these years, you just put in jeopardy for 
the bottle. How could you put our son at risk? How could you put our life, everything we built, the house, the everything? Um, and um, I kicked him out. I said, I'm, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this anymore. You need to find a place to stay and you need to leave. I um, left um, that day, went to class. I was actually supposed to be taking finals, bawled my eyes out all the way through finals. Um, a dear friend of mine was sitting next to me and she's like, you just need to tell the teacher because you just bombed that test. I called Dave's sister, let her know what was going on and said, I'm going home and I'm clearing out all the alcohol out of the house. Um, I got home, told Dave what I was going to do. And he said, I called Mayo and I am checking myself into treatment. Um, and my first response was, oh, you heard from work? You have to do that. And he went, no, work hasn't even called me. I'm doing this on my own. I know I have a problem. And that's the first time that he'd ever admitted that I, I have a problem. It is, it is out of control. I'm and that sorry. Is, and, and that is huge. That's the first step. You know, yep. we, we have to admit that, you know, we are powerless yep. over alcohol and our lives right. have become unmanageable. Right. And you are, and he already knew the unmanageable part. Yeah. You know, and uh, so often we, we, like, like I said earlier with you, we want to stop. We have yeah. every intention. We know that, you know, I'm sorry. I, you've heard every excuse in the book, every excuse, yeah. you know, having a bad day. We'd find justification of why we could drink. Yeah. We're having a good day. Find a Let's celebrate it. it exactly. Yeah. We have every intention. Yep. I'm yeah. going to slow down. But there's just something that once that alcohol hits that pleasure center, yeah. it's got you. And they have done, they have shown studies and people that don't have those addictive personalities or whatever, where the levels are completely different of where they hit your brain. Yep. So for somebody like me, I'm already at 80. Where a normal person, they're still at 40. So they can handle their right. alcohol normally. Yeah. I can't stop at just one. I got to have the whole bottle. Yep. And that, that was Dave towards the end. I mean... Many times at the campground, I'd be making a beer run over to Wisconsin because we were out. And it wasn't just him. Um, I drank too. Um, you know, over the years, I kind of tapered back because I had to be the one to make sure we got home okay. Um, you know, calling if he went out to his brother's or out to a friend's house. Hey, how many of you had? Because that's what you do. Um you know, to drive Jordan home. Do I need to come get you? No, no, no. I've only had one or two. Deep down, you knew that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so he would drive home with Jordan. Luckily, thank God, nothing happened. But um, that took me in treatment. They do family days. And that was my big thing with Jordan or with Dave opening up to me about that and me telling him, um, blessed every single day that he makes that decision not to drink. Um, but telling him you go back and I'm out. I, um, when Dave went to treatment, I felt it was on me. I did the first 30 days with him that, I probably did longer than that, but um, I did 30 days to help him and support him and show him that you can do this and I'm going to help you through this. Um, Jordan was six and so too young to really even realize six, seven, to realize what was going on, but yet knew dad well, he'd pass out on the couch, you know, um, Dave wouldn't be around for him. Um, you know, he's either working, drinking, passed out. And that's a huge role because not only, are you, you know, you're the nurturer, you're the mom. So not only do you have the added stress of, of trying to make sure that your child's 
being reared in the way he should go. But then you find you're also making excuses for his father. Oh. And, you know, well, daddy's just sleeping. Daddy's mm -hmm. had a hard day. Dad had a long day today at work. Um, yeah. Going to family functions, making the deal with Dave. Just a few. Just have a couple. You don't need to get drunk, you know. Um, and getting home, he'd make up for it. He'd walk in the door and then, you know, when you'd go to family functions, he'd drink beer because he had the tolerance up. Get home and it was the captain. Um, if I we were at a family function and I saw him starting the captain, I knew we needed to cut the night short because he was going to get out of control. Um, and I was embarrassed. Um, there's a lot of guilt to the spouse. You know, I heard it from people. Well, wow, you drove him to drink, didn't you? Mm. You know, we all have our crutches. We all have our... Um, you know, I'm not perfect. Far from it. You know, with yeah, my my panic attacks and all that, Dave. And and so through therapy, realizing that that's on me, not on him, and his drinking's on him, not on me. That that takes a lot to work through. That it was his choice to deal with everything with the bottle, and not verbally talking, working it through. Um, but Dave's not a person to share his feelings. Um, never has been. Stereotypical male. Yeah. You know, um, protector. Um, he'll, he's a wonderful man. Um, he's totally my soulmate, my best friend. I can't imagine my life without him. Um, and so with the drinking, when it got so bad, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do was to tell him, you need to leave. And because of your drinking, you can't be alone with your son because I can't trust you mm -hmm. to make sure that he's going to be okay and you're not going to be in the bottle and driving. Um, that was hard because Dave's a tremendous dad. Um, Absolutely. You, you can't help who you love. You... You hate, you hate the behavior, but you love the person. You hate the disease. Right. Yeah. Um, alcoholism. I mean, my dad, um, I believe my dad was an alcoholic. I mean, um, but so, and they say I married somebody that's like my dad. So, um, I guess, you know, you're attracted to that type, you know, from your childhood and stuff, but, um, I don't know. Dave's recovery. He's um, the last drink was December 13th, 2011. His first day sober. Um, he actually did a tattoo on the back of a dream catcher with an eagle and has his um, sobriety date on there. I absolutely love it yeah. because my sobriety date is December 17th. 2011. Oh, so we're all going to be celebrating 10 years this year. Isn't it great? Yes, we are. I can't believe Dave, today I said to him, I said, I know Sherry's going to want to know your sobriety date. And I'm like, and he's like, pulls out and he's like, what's it say? <laughs> <laughs> Love it's right it. on his back. That is um, so awesome. But I mean, it's something that you, you celebrate every year. Every year, Jordan and I, um, the first year, of course, he gets the chip from AA. But after that, every year we've given him, I've gone to Amazon and I buy the chip and we celebrate it, the three of us. I have um, to be completely honest with you, and I know I get a little, I, I get some people that criticize me on this, but you know what, I don't care. I'm going to do me. Uh, one of the things is that I do, I have a clean counter, and I actually love getting that monthly reminder that, yes. hey, you have nine years and three months today. Yeah. Now, I know it's not about the year and how much time, because we all know, in reality, we're only given 24 okay. hours and we could lose it all at any time. Yep. I'm one drink away from losing everything. Correct. So when I see that monthly reminder, I love it. And it shows me how far I've come. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it to brag, and, but in some ways I am because it's kind of like the creator's given me a lot of 24s and they've added yep. into a month. 
and they've added into a year. Yep. And that's exciting. So you know what? I don't care what anybody says. I will post every month on my clean counter. I'm so grateful for this day. Yep. And that's, you know, as a spouse of um, somebody in recovery, um, you know, they're, hell, we've been through hell and back. We all have. Um, but as a spouse, you know, they talked about in recovery, in treatment of the slippery slope, you know, um, you know, the uh, death of my dad in 2014, that sucked. Um, and that impacted both of us. The death of Dave's dad in 2015. Um, you know, that as a spouse, you just got to go and go, you okay? Mm -hmm. Making sure that we're checking in to say, you got this and I'm here. And if you're feeling like you're going down that slope, let's do a check. Let's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I did it the other night, you know, you have issues with a 16 year old kid. And you just kind of look at them and go, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And then I'm fine. I'm like, well, as a spouse, we just need to make sure if we're seeing something that we're just checking you. It's not that I'm trying to manipulate or, you know, I'm just checking in because I'm grateful for all these years that had you not quit, we wouldn't have you wouldn't have the relationship with your son that you do now. Um, uh, the drinking, um, I mean, I still drink. For the longest time, we didn't have any booze in the house. Slowly, I brought back in a beer here or there. Um, but, and that still makes me nervous to this day. I don't know why beer in my mind is okay to have in the refrigerator, but when the hard liquor's there, I'm like, okay, all right, I got to mark the bottle. And he's all these years sober, um, but it's still in my mind. I know for myself, being completely honest with you, one of the worst times for me is usually kind of when the first parts of summer come oh. and you, feel, you hear you're in your backyard, it's barbecue season, camper season, and you hear somebody click that can open. Yeah. Now, my drug of choice was wine. I was a huge wine drinker. I was weaned on it. You know, my dad had his own vineyard. My dad was a vinmeister. He, he made his own wine. My dad was also a beer meister, made his own beer. So I grew around that. So I associate summer, you know, yep. from high school on, fun times. I've yep. had some of my best times. And unfortunately, they have circled it around drinking. And I always tell everybody, I don't fault anybody for having a drink because if I could handle my shit, I'd be drinking right, right with you. Yeah. But I can't stop at just one. So drinking can no longer be a part of my life. But I never condemn anybody for it. Yeah. And I always say this every time. Prohibition didn't work either. It is legal. <laughs> Yep. Sooner or later, you're going to have to be inoculated to it. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with social settings where there is alcohol. Right. That was something, you know, that, uh, you know, of course, we were off camping season when um, Dave quit. Um, he was really concerned. So was I, you know, because drinking down at the campground, that's, you know, um, of what are people going to think? You know, um, Dave handled it amazing. Most of our close friends at the campground knew we had made the call and said, this is what's going on. Um, a few of them kind of went, it's about time. You know, they had seen it. Um, but, you know, one night, Dave, we were around the campground or campfire and somebody said, went to hand Dave a beer. You know, he had his koozie, didn't realize, you know, it's a Diet Coke. Um, and Dave went, no. I, I quit that stuff, but go ahead, you know, and just, I was so proud of him for owning it of, you know, Hey, go ahead, you know, and, um, it now at the campground people, well, there's many more. I mean, we get older, we don't. Well, not to on, mention, but... not to mention you two are a solid unit 
and the people that you associate with, they're also very respectful. Yeah. They don't want to see him set up for a fail. Correct. The people that care about you the most realize that that could be a potential trigger. Yeah. You know, campground, throwing bags, good yep. times. Those are triggers. Yep. But I know for myself, there are different pathways. My pathway happens to be the spiritual 12 step. So I am very grateful that the creator has given me that spiritual toolkit so that when I know I'm having an issue, especially like on family events, I do things to protect myself. I drive separately because if things start to get heavy, I know I have that way out. Mm -hmm. So I put little contingency plans in yep. because I don't, I know I can't go back to that hell again because quite frankly, with many of us, we don't know if we have another recovery in us. Right. This could be the one that does us in. Mm -hmm. So with you talking about all the great thing that Dave's done, what was it like for you personally? What was the hell that was going through you? You were being the nurturer. You're taking care of your husband. You're taking care of your child. But what were you doing for Tammy? How was Tammy coping? Not well. Um, thank God for my friends because I would vent to them and, um, you know, I was dealing with my own stuff, my panic attacks and my own anxiety and, um, just dealing with the loss of my mom, um, trying to just get through every single day one step at a time. Um, I remember Dave, the night my mom died and I just looked down and I said, I can't do this. And Dave looked at me and he went, you're going to get out of bed tomorrow morning and you're going to put one foot in front of the other. And that's how we, I guess, both of us have looked at this. Um, treatment was just as good for me as it was for him. Family days of getting that, um, I remember asking, why was I not good enough? Why was Jordan not good enough for you to quit drinking? Why um, I missed my best friend being able to talk to him. Um, you know, keeping my stuff bottled up because you can't talk to somebody that's drunk. Yeah. You, you can't rationalize. Correct. You can talk, but you're not getting anywhere. No. Um, hiding, you know, just making excuses. A lot of people thought that um, a lot of the excuses were me because of my anxiety, but a lot of them were Dave that, um, hey, you want to come out? Well, he's already in the bag. Um, no, I'm not feeling up to it tonight. Or, um, And you feel a little bit resentful because it's kind of like, you know, I've already got one child to take care of. Yeah. Now I have to take care of you. Right. And... I have to make excuses for you. And you had brought this up earlier about the whole family dynamics and the family functions. Mm -hmm. What's so hilarious about it is everybody already knew. That's usually the, the thing that we try to hide in our head. Yeah. That we don't think anybody knows, so we want to keep it on the down low. But I've had more and more people tell me, Sherry, we already knew you had an issue. Right. Um, I think Dave helped... Um, hit it really well from certain people. My family, hands down, knew that there there was issues. I mean, my mom had brought it up to me years before she passed. Of, And at that time, Dave and I both were really drinking. I mean, we were down at Kathy's Pub all the time, you know, with all the, you know, all of our friends and pull tabs. And, um, you know, luckily we lived close enough off 4th Street that we'd just sometimes walk home or you don't have very far to go. Um, you know, but my mom had, you know, several times had said, I think Dave's got a problem. My dad and my stepmom a couple times had kind of, they knew, um, our friends knew. But what did you do to try to escape, though, for self-care for you? going through all of that and having that heaviness, what did you do? You said you saw, uh, suffer from panic attacks. Yep. How did you, how did you find yourself trying to control and, and juggle that to have some, 
to provide some sort of sanity for you and your child? You know, towards the end of his drinking, you know, after my mom died, I was kind of forced into my own recovery with my panic attacks and stuff um, because I didn't have that crutch of my mom. Um, but so towards the end of Dave's drinking, I think Jordan and I, we'd go to the park, we'd take off, we'd um, go and do stuff that, you know, was without Dave. Um, and that I think was more my self care. Um, you know, just going and having fun. Um, I was with, you know, my girlfriends quite a bit, um, camper on the weekends. Um, I was, I'd hide out, you know, I'd try, you know, Dave would be at our site and I needed to just get away. Um, but in the back of your mind, you're wondering how drunk is he getting back there? What is he, you know, um, I don't really know that I did a whole lot of self care for myself at that mm -hmm. time. Um, it was just going through the motion of every single day to just get through it. Right. Um, you know, and you just hide it. A lot of people, I didn't know Dave drank that much. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of Dave's drinking was at home. Or the campground. So a lot of people that weren't around that didn't see how bad his drinking had got. Often we sequester ourselves. Yeah. We make sure that, you know, uh, it, it gets to become too much work to wonder who you've drunk dialed the night before. Right. Or, you know, what an ass I've made of myself the night before. So it's just so much easier to barricade yourself in your house, kind of put your friends on hold, yep. and just get your drink on. Right. This way you don't have to explain it to anybody. You don't have to worry about losing your friends because you've already gotten rid of them. Right. So you don't have to go through that. Yeah, and one of the jokes that the camper, you know, Dave's cousin, who's like a sister to him, camps right, camped right across from us. And her kids, Dave had gotten really drunk one night, and this was before we had the patio, and he was in the chair, and the chair just slowly started falling backwards, and Dave was totally oblivious because he was so drunk and um, Big Jor and East, I think it was Travis at the time, just kind of laughed because Dave just kind of fell over in the chair and you know made sure the beer didn't um, tip drop. drop or anything. And you know, it was a joke looking back now though, um, you know, it was one of his, um, you know, and doing the helicopter trying to get to the camper making sure that he got into the camper okay. Um, and then being so drunk that you'd wake up the next morning and he doesn't remember. Um, he didn't black out a whole lot of times. Um, but, you know, I remember him being sober for like two weeks and he woke up one day and he's like, I feel amazing. He said, I never realized that I was hung over all that time. He said, I just thought that's the way I was supposed to wake up and feel. Um, you know, but I don't think that I, for taking care of myself, I guess it was my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, my best friend down in Arizona, um, daily mm -hmm. talking to her and mm -hmm. I can't deal with this anymore. Um, I'll just take Jordan and go, but well, where do I go? Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you're still in love with this person. You know the person you fell in love with is in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. That it's the person you're hating right now, it's not the person, it's the booze. The disease. Um, and so he's in there. And so then you're, you can't leave because then you know if, you love. right, then if you leave and he happens to, hurt himself or get into an accident, I wasn't there to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, and that's a lot to take on. It, 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 it's, it's a lot of stress to take on. And unfortunately, you know, now that, uh, you know, he's, he's done the treatment part and I have to tell you, and we had talked about this before, I don't think this town offers much as services for the families no not at all um you know i was telling you after dave's treatment they had recommended that i go to al-anon 
Well, that I came home and I looked at Dave and I went, they told me you're going to go and start drinking again. I should just prepare myself. I should prepare an exit plan. Um, and I'm like, they were so, um, you know, we're just starting the recovery process and they're already, um, dooming you to fail. Right. And I just totally, I said to Dave, I'm not going back. And then Dave going to, um, AA, he said the same thing. He came home one day and he's like, I can't do that. He said, I walk in there all excited about my recovery. And he said, I leave wanting a drink. Mm -hmm. Um, because he said, they're just so doom and gloom. And so setting you up to fail, it's like, set us up to succeed. Mm -hmm. Don't, we know in the back of our mind that at any moment in those 24 hours, he can decide to drink. Right. Um, we know that. Mm -hmm. So don't throw it in our face. Right. Um, I think that's where a lot of the Al-Anon have failed. Mm -hmm. You know, those groups have just kind of dismantled because of that. Mm -hmm. Because people, people are going there for hope. Mm -hmm. They're going there for what is your story? And oh my gosh, you've been sober 20, whatever years. How did you do this? Mm -hmm. How did you work through this with your spouse? Not, you know, he's got five days under his belt, but you wait. They hit that 30 day mark and they want to go grab a drink to celebrate. Yeah, I Don't, think that's. Uh... I think what's really frustrating because because I have been to some really really wonderful twelve step meetings and and it's really sad when you hear that because that and that's part of the reason why I created the podcast and the Facebook page is to break the stigma of that and show that with a lot of hard work whatever pathway you choose there are many pathways out there I say this in every podcast there is the holistic. There's a well variety, Native American. There's a spiritual 12 step. There, you know, there, there's just so many different routes you can go. And not every path works for everybody. Right. And, and that is really sad because you're absolutely right. You don't want to be set up to fail to before fail. you even get going into the game. Right. And I also feel that this town absolutely has nothing for children or teens. No. And that needs to change. We we are a pretty strong recovery town where there is meetings. Now, granted, with, with the pandemic going on right now, as we're coming out of it, the meeting situation has changed. Not everybody has access to a Zoom, much less a computer. Right. And not only that, a lot of us are missing that personal contact. Mm -hmm. We uh, A big part of, I know... a only speaking for myself, a big part of my program is being around my tribe. No one knows an alcoholic better than an alcoholic. Right. And so that's been sorely missing. But I truly feel that there is a huge, huge misjustice with not having more things set up for, for uh, children of, you know, of parents that are, are, are addicted. And we all know that, I also say this, that in many cases, addiction and mental health are co-occurring. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand. And, but I, I just, I really feel that this town could do so much more for the families of the addict. Yeah. And we don't do near enough. We don't do anything. Right. No, even with um, Dave going through treatment, you had family day, but that was, um, you'd have one Friday that he had to spill his guts to us. And then the next Friday we were able to, um, kind of answer what he had told us the week before, but, um, Jordan being the age he was at was not allowed to come. And I think that was, um, I think that was wrong. I think even at six, seven years old, Jordan, Jordan knew he's a smart kid. He knew, um, you know, and I know at one of the meetings, Jor had made a why I like my dad sober versus drinking and Dave has that hung on his side of the bed. Yep. Um, I think treatment for Jor and I would have been good, um, but it wasn't an option part of that treatment. And even with al they, you know, know he's too young. He doesn't know what happened. Yeah, they're smart kids. Mm -hmm. They do see that. They do know what happened. 
um, you know, to work through that. Um, there's, there's nothing. One last question that I have for you. If you could tell another spouse, what advice would you give them? Love them. Um, don't walk behind or ahead, walk side by side. Um, be supportive, but, and don't judge them because we all have our faults. Um, and, but there comes a time that with me, it came to a point that it was harmful for Jordan. Um, but forgive. That was a big thing for me to forgive Dave for everything. That's tough, That's tough but just love them, support them. Hopefully they can find their way to recovery like Dave has. And then once they're in recovery, you walk beside them and you hold their hand when they're going down that slippery slope and you, you can't, Dave always says this, you can't stop me from drinking. Nope, I can't, but I can give you the tools to not take that drink. I can offer myself to help you just like he has all these years with my panic attacks. Um, I can offer something to talk you off that ledge. So it's just love. Well, I have to tell you, thank you so much. And I didn't cry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I have to thank you and, and I have to commend you so much because like I said, it, it is not easy. You have lived a it's been a tough path and it is never easy to watch the person that you love most go through this. You want to be able to take that pain. However, it's their journey yep. and you can talk till you're blue in the face, but until they're ready to make that choice, yep. there's nothing you can do. I always say too, that, you know, a, a lot of us where I wanted to break that stigma is we're usually told that we deserve what's coming to us. There's no casserole coming to our door, even though our alcoholism is a disease and it's terminal for us. Right. We're not getting those, those things, but we also, with the miracle of recovery, we can be great people. Mm -hmm. We can be that great spouse. We can be that great, uh, great mother. We can be that great sister, great brother. We can be productive adults and make our way and people can be proud of us. Yep. I truly believe everyone has an addiction. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just a little bit more dangerous and some of them by the grace of our creator or the grace of your higher power, he will see us through so that we don't have a fatal outcome. Yep. And it's because of people like you that have stood by and you have loved them unconditionally. Yes, you have put the you have put in a place that I don't know how much more I could do with you. I'm just telling you straight up, this is hard for me. There may where you had to walk away mm -hmm. and to help you and help your child. And that's huge. And that's loving you. And believe it or not, that's loving your partner. So I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I, uh, um, you are really to be commended. Uh, oh, not I many that, people, but... no, not many people. It, it's very hard to, to talk about, you know, we always focus on the addict and, or the, the, the alcoholic, but not so much on the family and to get a bird's eye view of, of what families go through, you know, you're, People seeing this podcast will be like, wow, that's my story. So happy she shared it. So thank you so much, Tammy, thank for being for here today. Me. It was an honor. Appreciate it.